again. It's been two days since anyone's come to visit. Mac is in a bad mood. He says we are losing money hand over fist. He says he's going to sell the whole lot of us. When Thelma, a blue and yellow macaw, demands, Kiss me, big boy, for the third time in ten minutes, Mac throws a soda can at her. Thelma's wings are clipped so that she can't fly, but she can still hop. She leaps aside just in the nick of time. Pucker up, she says with a shrill whistle. Max stomps to his office and slams the door shut. I wonder if my visitors have grown tired of me. Maybe if I learn a trick or two, it will help. Humans do seem to enjoy watching me eat. Luckily, I am always hungry. I am a gifted eater. A silverback must eat 45 pounds of food a day if he wants to stay a silverback. 45 pounds of fruit and leaves and seeds and stems and bark and vines and rotten wood. Also, I enjoy the occasional insect. I'm going to try to eat more. Maybe then we will get more visitors. Tomorrow, I will eat 55 pounds of food. Maybe even 55. That should make Mac happy. Bob. I explain my plan to Bob. Ivan, he says. Trust me on this one. The problem is not your appetite. He hops onto my chest and licks my chin, checking for leftovers. Bob is a stray, which means he does not have a permanent address. He is also speedy, so wily, that mall workers long ago gave up trying to catch him. Bob can sneak into cracks and crevices like a tracked rat. He lives well off the ends of hot dogs he pulls from the trash. For dessert, he laps up spilled lemonade and splattered ice cream cones. I've tried to share my food with Bob, but he is a picky eater and says he prefers to hunt for himself. Bob is tiny, wiry, and fast, like a barking squirrel. He is nut-colored and big-eared. His tail moves like weeds in the wind, spiraling, dancing. Bob's tail makes me dizzy and confused. It has meanings within meanings, like human words. I am sad, it says. I am happy, it says. Beware, I may be tiny, but my teeth are sharp. Gorillas don't have any use for tails. Our feelings are complicated. Our rumps are unadorned. Bob used to have three brothers and two sisters. Humans tossed them out of a truck onto the freeway when they were just a few weeks old. Bob rolled into a ditch. The others did not. His first night on the highway, Bob slept in the icy mud of the ditch. When he woke, he was so cold that his legs would not bend for an hour. The next night, Bob slept under some dirty hay near the Big Top Mall garbage bins. The following night, Bob found a spot in the corner of my domain where the glass is broken. I dreamed that I'd eaten a furry donut, and when I woke in the dark, I discovered a tiny puppy snoring on top of my belly. It had been so long since I felt the comfort of another's warmth that I wasn't sure what to do. Not that I hadn't had visitors. Mac had been in my domain, of course, and many other keepers. I'd seen my share of rats zip past, and the occasional wayward sparrow had fluttered in through a hole in my ceiling, but they never stayed long. I didn't move all night for fear of waking Bob. Wild. Once I asked Bob why he didn't want a home. Humans, I noticed, seemed to be irrationally fond of dogs. I could see why a puppy would be easier to cuddle with than, say, a gorilla. Everywhere is my home, Bob answered. I am a wild beast, my friend, untamed and undaunted. I told Bob he could work in the shows like Snickers, the poodle who rides Stella. Bob said Snickers sleeps on a pink pillow in Mac's office. He said she eats foul-smelling meat from a can. He made a face, his lips curled, revealing tiny needles of teeth. Poodles, he said, are parasites. Picasso. Matt gives me a fresh crayon, a yellow one, and ten pieces of paper. Time to earn your keep, Picasso, he mutters. I wonder who this Picasso is. Does he have a tire swing like me? Does he ever eat his crayons? I know I've lost my magic, so I try my very best. I clutch the crayon and think, I scan my domain. What is yellow? A banana. I draw a banana. The paper tears, but only a little bit. I lean back and Mac picks up the drawing. Another day, another scribble, he says. One down, nine to go. What else is yellow? I wonder, scanning my domain. I draw another banana, and then I draw eight more. Three visitors. Three visitors are here, a woman, a boy, a girl. 
I strut across my domain for them. I dangle from my tire swing. I eat three banana peels in a row. The boy spits at my window. The girl throws a handful of pebbles. Sometimes I'm glad the glass is there. My visitors return. After the show, the spit pebble children come back. I display my impressive teeth. I splash in my filthy pool. I grunt and hoot. I eat and eat and eat some more. The children pound their pathetic chests. They toss more pebbles. Slimy chimps, I mutter. I throw a meatball at them. Sometimes I wish the glass were not there. Sorry. I'm sorry I called those children slimy chimps. My mother would be ashamed of me. Julia. Like the spit pebble children, Julia is a child. But that, after all, is not her fault. When her father, George, cleans them all each night, Julia sits in, by my domain. She could sit anywhere she wants, by the carousel, in the empty food court, on the bleachers coated in sawdust. But I am not bragging when I say that she always chooses to sit with me. I think it's because we both love to draw. Sarah, Julia's mother, used to help clean them all. But when she got sick and grew pale and stooped, Sarah stopped coming. Every night, Julia offers to help George, and every night, he says firmly, Homework, Julia. The floors will just get dirty again. Homework, I've discovered, involves a sharp pencil and thick books and long sighs. I enjoy chewing pencils. I'm sure I would excel at homework. Sometimes Julia dozes off, and sometimes she reads her books, but mostly she draws pictures and talks about her day. I don't know why people talk to me, but they often do. Perhaps it's because they think I can't understand them, or perhaps it's because I can't talk back. Julia likes science and art. She doesn't like Lila Burpee, who teases her because her clothes are old. And she doesn't like Deshaun Williams, who teases her too, but in a nice way. And she would like to be a famous artist when she grows up. Sometimes Julia draws me. I'm an elegant fellow in her pictures, with my silverback gleaming like moon on moss. I never look angry the way I do on the fading billboard by the highway. I always look a bit sad, though. Drawing Bob. I love Julia's pictures of Bob. She draws him flying across the page, a blur of feet and fur. She draws him motionless, peeking out from behind a trash can or the soft hill of my belly. Sometimes in her drawings, Julia gives Bob wings or a lion's mane. Once she gave him a tortoise shell. But the best thing she ever gave him wasn't a drawing. Julia gave Bob his name. For a long time, no one knew what to call Bob. Now and then a mall worker would try to approach him with a tidbit. Here, doggy, they'd call, holding out a french fry. Come on, pooch, they'd say. How about a little piece of a sandwich? But when he would always vanish into the shadows before anyone could get too close. One afternoon, Julia decided to draw the little dog curled up in the corner of my domain. First, she watched him for a long time, chewing on her thumbnail. I could tell she was looking at him the way an artist looks at the world when she's trying to understand it. Finally, she grabbed her pencil and set to work. When she finished, she held up the page. There he was, the tiny big-eared dog. He was smart and cunning, but his gaze was wistful. Under the picture were three bold, confident marks, circled in black. I was pretty certain it was a word, even though I couldn't read it. Julia's father peered over the shoulder. That's him exactly, he said, nodding. He pointed to the circled marks. I didn't realize his name was Bob, he said. Me either, said Julia. She smiled. I had to draw him first. Bob and Julia. Bob will not let humans touch him. He says their scent upsets his digestion. But every now and then I see him sitting at Julia's feet. Her fingers move gently just behind his right ear. Mac. Usually Mac leaves after the last show, but tonight he is in his office working late. When he's done, he stops by my, by my domain and stares at me for a long time while he drinks from a brown bottle. George joins him, broom in hand, and Mac says the things he always says. How about that game last night? And business was, has been slow, but it'll get better soon. You'll see. And don't forget to empty the trash. Mac glances over at the picture Julia is drawing. What are you making? He asks. It's for my mom, Julia says. It's a flying dog. She holds up her drawing, eyeing it critically. She likes airplanes and dogs. Hmm, 
Mac murmurs, sounding unconvinced. He looks at George. How's the wife doing, anyway? About the same, George says. She has good days and bad days. Yeah, don't we all, Mac says. Mac starts to leave, then pauses. He reaches into his pocket, pulls out a crumpled green bill, and presses it into George's hand. Here, Mac says with a shrug. Buy the kids some more crayons. Mac is already out the door before George can yell, Thanks! Not sleepy. Stella, I say after Julia and her father go home, I can't sleep. Of course you can, she says. You are the king of sleepers. Shh, Bob says from his perch on my belly. I'm dreaming about chili fries. I'm tired, I say, but I'm not sleepy. What are you tired of, Stella asks. I think for a while. It's hard to put it in words. Gorillas are not complainers. We're dreamers, poets, philosophers, nap takers. I don't know exactly. I kick my tire swing. I think I may be a little tired of my domain. That's because it's a cage, Bob tells me. Bob is not always tactful. I know, Stella says. It's a very small domain. And you're a very big gorilla, Bob adds. Stella, I ask. Yes. I noticed you were limping more than usual today. Is your leg bothering you? Just a little, Stella answers. I sigh. Bob resettles. His ears flick. He drools a bit, but I don't mind. I'm used to it. Try eating something, Stella says. That always makes you happy. I eat an old brown carrot. It doesn't help, but I don't tell Stella. She needs to sleep. You could try remembering a good day, Stella suggests. That's what I do when I can't sleep. Stella remembers every moment since she was born. Every scent, every sunset, every slight, every victory. You know I can't remember much, I say. There's a difference, Stella says gently, between can't remember and won't remember. That's true, I admit. Not remembering can be difficult, but I've had a lot of time to work on it. Memories are precious, Stella adds. They help tell us who we are. Try remembering all your keepers. You always liked Carl, the one with the harmonica. Carl, yes, I remember how he gave me a coconut when I was just a juvenile. It took me all day to open it. I try to recall other keepers I have known, the humans who cleaned my domain and prepared my food, and sometimes kept me company. There was Juan, who poured Pepsis into my waiting mouth, and Katrina, who used to poke me with a broom when I was sleeping, and Ellen, who sang, How much money is that monkey in the window, with a sad smile while she screamed scrubbed my water bowl. And there was Gerald, who once brought me a box of fat, sweet strawberries. Gerald was my favorite keeper. I haven't had a real keeper in a long time. Max says he doesn't have the money to pay for an ape babysitter. These days, George cleans my cage and Mac is the one who feeds me. When I think about all the people who have taken care of me, mostly it's Mac, I recall. Day in and day out, year after year after year, Mac, who bought me and raised me and says I'm no longer cute. As if a silverback could ever be cute. Moonlight falls on the frozen carousel, on the silent popcorn stand, on the stall of leather belts that smells like long gone cows. The heavy work of Stella's breathing sounds like the wind in the trees. I wait for sleep to find me. The Beetle Mac gives me a new black crayon and a fresh pile of paper. It's time to work again. I smell the crayon. I roll it in my hands, press the sharp points against my palm. There's nothing I love more than a new crayon. I search my domain for something to draw. What is black? An old banana peel would work, but I've eaten them all. Knot tag is brown. My little pool is blue. The yogurt raising I'm saving for later this afternoon is white, at least on the outside. Something moves in the corner. I have a visitor. A shiny beetle has stopped by. Bugs often wander through my domain on their way to somewhere else. Hello, beetle, I say. He freezes, silent. Bugs never want to chat. The beetle's an attractive bug with a body like a glossy nut. He's black as a starless night. That's it, I'll draw him. It's hard making a picture of something new. I don't get the chance that often, but I try. I look at the beetle. 
who's being kind enough not to move. Then back at my paper, I draw his body, his legs, his little antennae, his sour expression. I'm lucky. The beetle stays all day. Usually bugs don't linger when they visit. I'm beginning to wonder if he's feeling all right. Bob, who knows, who's been known to munch on bugs from time to time, offers to eat them. I tell Bob that won't be necessary. I'm just finishing my last picture when Mac returns. George and Julia are with him. Mac enters my domain and picks up my drawing. What the heck is this, he asks. Beats me what Ivan thinks he's drawing. This is a picture of nothing, a big black nothing. Julia's standing just outside my domain. Can I see, she asks. Mac holds up my picture to the window. Julia tilts her head. She squeezes one eye shut. Then she opens her eye and scans my domain. I know, she exclaims. It's a beetle. See that beetle over there by Ivan's pool? Man, I just sprayed this place for bug. Mac walks over to the beetle, lifts his foot. Before Mac can stomp, the beetle skitters away, disappearing through a crack in the wall. Mac turns back to my drawing. So you figure this is a beetle, huh? If you say so, kid. Oh, that's a beetle for sure, Julia says, smiling at me. I know a beetle when I see one. It's nice. I think having a fellow artist around.